Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd like, subscribe, and share with a friend. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, holy shit. I only have one year left on my contract. What am I going to do? And I'm like, I, I need to go do something and show these people that I'm a good fucking player. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious and I was malicious and I don't care. <laughs> Welcome, uh, Chris Weidman, to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Good to have you. Um, uh, awesome. You took the time uh, out of your busy schedule to do this. I appreciate it. Um, listen, I want to go back, uh, obviously, uh, before you get to Ottawa and talk about your minor career growing up in in st louis it me when i was growing up as a kid there's two places to play hockey in the u.s it was minnesota it was new england boston area um it, you know st louis wasn't known for that how was the minor hockey growing up there and and how did it get better and why did it get better for you as a kid um yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you in uh, in your analysis because it was the same way when I was growing up. I think you have to add in Chicago was was uh, a big player in the game when when I uh, when I started playing AAA hockey. But um, for me as a minor hockey player, I was fortunate enough to be coached by ex NHL players uh, all the way through. Um, I think if you look at the St. Louis Blues and the St. Louis Blues alumni and what they've done with minor hockey in St. Louis, um, they've taken it from a you know smaller market when i was coming up and i would say that the minor hockey here now is is as good as anywhere else in the country and and it's due to the 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 level of coaching that we have and it's predominantly ex nhl players ex blues players and and it's uh you know kind of put st louis hockey on the map yeah it's funny uh, a lot of honestly a lot of areas in the states who weren't you know big hockey hotbeds, a lot of NHLers end up staying in those cities. And, and because they have kids, they start getting into the programs. And it's awesome for the game of hockey in the U.S., no question about it. Um, so you played in the Pee Wee tournament and all that. And then you go off to, um, yeah, you, yeah, you play at prep school. And then you play a year in the USHL and then off to Miami. Um, when you get to Miami, um, your development like that first year at Miami it, coming from the USHL was that a big jump f for you like you know as far as adjusting to the speed the level of talent and all that when you went your first year of college yeah for sure I think you know I was supposed to play two years of junior we had a uh a, a guy that was at Miami that left uh Alec Martinez to go play for the for the LA Kings um, and so that was kind of unforeseen and, and I was, I was brought in a year early as a true freshman. So, um, just kind of thrown right into the fire. I mean, I got on campus, I was probably 160 pounds soaking wet. Um, you know, they put me in the gym, they put me to work and, and I remember our head coach Enrico Blasi calling me into his office and was like, you know, you're going to run our first power play unit and, and and you need to figure, figure it out. You got to figure out a way to, to be a contributor. And, you know, I was 18, I was kind of thrown right into the fire and, um, you know, it was kind of something that I ran with and, and, um, I put a lot of work in, uh, with some, you know, skills coaches that we had there and, and, and spent a lot of time on the ice, just trying to hone my skills. And, and I think just kind of being thrusted into that role with, with basically no choice, but to, try to succeed and, and help the team, um, you know, really helped me accelerate my development. I think, you know, when I was in the USHL, it, that was a bigger jump for me from going from midget to the USHL than from USHL to college. Um, but, you know, just the, the experience of, of kind of just not really having an option, but to, uh, to succeed and, and try to help the team is, uh, you know, something I can look back on. And, and that was, uh, you know, huge for my career. Yeah, no, I, uh, 
I had the same thing. I'm from Illinois, so I kind of same thing. With ju- going to, jumping to juniors was way harder than jumping from juniors to college. And I'm looking at your roster. You came in with like a lot of guys. It's a lot of Illinois guys. The, the Laverty was, was he, is that same year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, yeah, Wingles. We had the Tommy <laughs> yeah. Wingles, Vinny Laverty. We had a we had a really good crew of uh, Chicago kids, and I and and um. You know that that was that was cool because all the you know we had a ton of kids that were just students that were from Chicago, so it was a, a cool network. Met a lot of people, and and uh, St. Louis was the same way. There's a lot of kids from St. Louis that went to school at Miami, so um, just a, a really fun group of guys that we had there when I when I was in school. And um, you know, it's I mean, looking back on it, it's some of my uh, best hockey memories. So oh nine, uh, you get drafted uh, and. Uh, Hundredth overall, fourth round. Were you were you shocked when you got drafted? Were you expecting to be drafted? Do you think you had a shot? What was the deal with the draft? What's our listening audience? How how far do you want me to go with this? <laughs> you can go as far as you want. We're All fine. right. So so uh, my agent or family advisor is is like, hey man, like you know, there's a chance you could get drafted, but you know. I don't know. So I don't want you to be upset at me if it doesn't happen. Um, so I'm talking with my parents and my parents are like, you know what? Like you would rather be drafted and, and, and not be there than to go and, and be at the draft and not get drafted. Right. And so I think we all agreed on that. Um, obviously I'm nervous. So uh, I think the draft was a Friday night for the first round Wait, Saturday. It? This was in 09 at, in Montreal. And, oh, it was in Montreal. Okay. Yeah. So, so, Instead of going to Montreal, I decided to, you know, I'm just after my freshman year of college, so I <laughs> decided to go over to one of my buddy's houses and and uh, we had a couple beers and maybe too many beers and and we we took it pretty deep and and you know I didn't plug my phone in and and the next day I get drafted by Ottawa in the fourth round, a hundredth overall. Well, my phone's dead. I'm with my buddies. We're out for breakfast and we're just hanging out and. <laughs> And uh, the restaurant that we were at had a TV and it was on the NHL network. So we're like screwing around and we go over to the TV and, and I actually had given my, my phone to the waitress to, to plug in and we go over to the TV and we see my name drafted Ottawa centers, hundredth overall. So I get my phone back and I, and I turn it on and I've got like all these missed calls from, from the late Brian Murray, who was the GM at the time. And, some of the the team services guys and they're like, Hey, it, like, do we have the right phone number? Like we're trying, <laughs> you got to get up here for development camp. Like, where the hell are you? Um, you know, so then I, I got to call them back. Then I call my parents, call my dad. And I'm like, Hey dad, I, I just got drafted in the NHL. And he's like, bullshit. I'm like, no, seriously, I, I did. Like, and, you know, I'm like at that time, like you had to go to a computer, like, li- like, look, you know, so he looks it up. He's like, no way. Like, that's, that's awesome. My, my mom is out of town. So we threw a little party at the house, like, you know, we celebrated a little bit, but just a, just a fun, uh, a fun memory of just, you know, everybody has their own draft story, but that was, you know, <laughs> just try to take the edge off a little bit. It ended up uh, working out. All right. Yeah. That's funny. You say that because it, my draft, yeah, 78 guys, guys didn't go to the draft, right? No one went, but, um, I found out I was in a bar room at college. You know, someone saw it on TV. They come up and told me, oh, you get dropped by the Canadians. I'm like, yeah, sure. See you later. <laughs> and, you know, at least um, they tried to reach out to me. I got a fucking letter like two weeks later saying, <laughs> you know, you're invited to training camp. Uh, it's like crazy, you know, but um, so drafted. Um, you finish. Were you ever tempted to leave Miami or did you say, listen, I'm committed here. I'm staying. I'm not going to turn pro. You know, I think. I had some early success in college. Um, I think the thing that really fueled me to stay and finish my four years, uh, one being I was on the team that lost in the national championship game my freshman year when we were leading by uh, two goals with a minute left to, to be you, the, the big heartbreaker there in the finals. Oh. Um, the group of guys that was in my class in the, in the year ahead of me, we were super close and um, just trying to work towards winning a national championship and then my senior year, my brother was coming in to be a freshman on our team. So I wanted to play a year with him. I think that was um, – that year with him is still the highlight of my hockey career, being able to be on the same team as my brother, um, having our family at a lot of the games. Just, you know, we had little things each year that kind of just drew me back to school. 
Now, I don't know if I, um, if I leave school a year or two early, if I end up being the player that I am today or, or being able to be in the NHL at the age of 32. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure happy that I was able to stay and, and to have those experiences. Does that still haunt you though, that college game? Cause I mean, I went to the frozen <laughs> four too. Uh, we were up three to one going in the third period against Denver. We didn't, you know, to go to the finals and we lost. And that's something I still think about. It's the best years, best, four of the best years of my life was college for sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, you see like, I had the ESPYs on, I think it was the last, his last <laughs> night of the night before and they like brought it up and I'm like, how are people still talking about this? Like, you know, and I, to this day, I haven't really, to this day, I've, I haven't watched the entire game because I don't want to like lose friends. You Cry. Know? I don't want, I don't want to yeah. like not talk to guys ever again. Yeah. You know, I've, I've always thought about like figuring out who to blame it on, but um, no, it was, I mean, just as heartbreaking as that uh, game was, I think it fueled us to be, um, you know, as individuals, better players. And as a team, you know, we were ranked number one through every single part of the next three years that I was in school there. And part of that was the drive to, you know, finish what we thought we, you know, should have. And unfortunately, we never got that chance. But, um, you know, it was some great years. So Chris, that yeah, that going to that Frozen Four, obviously, you know, you, anytime you have success you, with a group of guys like that, and you, you you're bound together forever, uh, the rest of your life, no question. And I heard Tim say at the college years were the best. You know, I I played three years of university, and, and you know, I loved it. I had had a blast, but I I couldn't wait to leave because I wanted to turn pro, and I left early. But you know, when I look back. Um, you know, I wish I left the year earlier because I missed a Stanley Cup. But, you know, it doesn't haunt me because, thank God, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team that won one. But so you go, you, you leave school, you go off to uh, to Ottawa training camp, uh, you play. Uh, well, you go to bingo. But what was that first camp like for you? Talk about going from college to the pro game now and that that step. How big a step was that for you? Yeah, that, that was a big step. That was, uh, you know, it was a lockout year. So training camp was in Binghamton. Um, we had, I think, 10 or 11 defensemen on NHL contracts, a few guys on one ways that were able to come down and play. Um, you know, there was no real CBA mandate and how much time you could spend at the rink or on the ice. Like it was pretty old school. Um so yeah, that was a it was a big step, but I, I mean, I was sent to the East Coast Hockey League at, after training camp. I, I spent two weeks there, um, or three weeks there. Played was that a uh, shock? Four or five? Did yeah, you I think mean, it was, was going the American League? Or? I mean, I I didn't even know really what the East Coast Hockey League was at that point in my life. You know, I was pretty, you know, I throughout my whole career, every level that I was able to achieve it was new for me because I didn't really know anybody that had gone through this before. You know, when I was drafted in the USHL. I was sitting in my high school class. I had no idea, you know, get a college scholarship. I didn't really know what to expect. You know, I, I committed to Miami. I think at 15 years old, I came back from a midget tournament and told my parents I was going to Miami university on a full ride. And they were like, <laughs> what are you, what are you talking about? So every, every step was kind of something new and this was no different. I, I, I really didn't know what to expect. I get sent to the East Coast Hockey League and that was just like, it was an eye opener, right? It's like the first time you're playing hockey and the guys on your team that you're competing against and the guys you're playing against are fighting to put food on the table for their families. And they'll do just about anything to make sure that you don't come out on top. So that was, that was kind of the, you know, aha moment as a pro, like, hey, this is like, you either figure it out and, and, and this is for real, or, you know, you play this contract out and you'll be working behind a desk. So I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate that I was able to have that experience, but, um, you know, I, my agent at the time had a voicemail saved. I like called him. I was like, I'll give all my money back. Just get me out of this place. Like <laughs> Elmira, I can't, I can't do this in. anymore. You know, <laughs> and I was there for like a week at the time. So, um, you know, those are, I mean, everybody goes through those moments in their career and, and, you know, unfortunately I had a few more after that, but, you know, I think that's kind of what 
you know, gets you on the right path. It builds you as a, as a person, as a player. I also think that's, I also think that's being from like St. Louis and growing up in the kind of that way of hockey. Cause that was similar to me. It's like that those things would happen, but like, I don't know what my expectations were. I was just like kind of taking it as I went and, and, you know, I, you know, like you said, hockey wasn't, it's, it, I, I think Illinois today is a hockey state. We talked about, you talk about Massachusetts. What was the other one? Minnesota. I thought Michigan was also a hockey state growing up, but um, yeah, I just think what you just said there too, like you, you, you don't, you know, as every level you're kind of getting to those things were happening, you were kind of just adjusting to it, but um, you kind of just brought back. Yeah. Just kind of being where I'm from at least. Until it, but until I get older, like I didn't really have a reference point, right? Like, you know, I had, like Paul and Jan Stassner from St. Louis, I looked up to those guys, Chris Butler, Ben Bishop, guys that, you know, were, went to the same high school that I did that were a few years ahead of me were doing all these things um, that I wanted to do, but I didn't know what to expect when I got there. And and as I became older and, and turned pro, I became friends with these guys and I was able to lean on them and, and ask for advice and, and different things. But, you know, as you're coming up, you're, you're, you know, you're just, you're experiencing all these new things. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have a great support system with my family and, and friends. And, um, you know, they're people that I've leaned on a ton throughout my career. So you get out of the Elmira, you get out of the coast and you go to bingo and you put up three awesome seasons, like, you know, 51 points, the second one, 61, uh, 19 goals, 42 assists in the third season there. And, uh, you go back to camp and you make the big club the following season. Um, God, you're there four years and let's get to the Uber and, um, <laughs> you establish yourself <laughs> because, because I, you, you establish We're going right yourself. There, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We don't care well, about your goals. Nothing. Let's just get to the You Uber. don't care. I was, I think I was defenseman of the year in the American League. We're <laughs> skipping over that. Oh, okay. Proud of you that you were a demon. I, don't I didn't know where see that. Tro- you were? I don't know. I don't think my wife has the trophy anywhere in, <laughs> no. in her office, but. She took it down. Yeah. All oh, right. So D man well, no, of the year. In so the, in I, I think a. I think when we when we talk about being in Binghamton, obviously I uh, got to, got a chance to play for Luke Richardson, who was our head coach, who I had uh, this past year in in Montreal as an assistant coach. But he was the guy that kind of turned me into a pro. Basically, it was like, hey, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to carry yourself to make it to the next level. And um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I got to play for him. I'm thankful, um, you know, that I got to play for him again this year, but you know, that, that was kind of like the, all right, now it's time to be a pro. Now it's time to take your career, uh, and maximize it. And I think that going into my third full year in Binghamton, I was in training camp in Ottawa. There was an inter squad scrimmage and there's 60 guys in camp. And I'm one of six guys that doesn't make the inter squad scrimmage lineup. And I'm looking around and I'm like, I'm the only guy with an NHL contract that's not in this scrimmage. I'm sitting in the weight room, laying on the floor, watching the Ryder Cup, which wasn't all that bad. But I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, holy shit, I only have one year left on my contract. What am I going to do? And I'm like, I, I need to go do something and show these people that I'm a good fucking player. And I went to Binghamton that year and, you know, it was like, I was a man on a mission. Like it, the pucks were going in the net. I was making plays. I was doing shit. Cause I was like, if I don't do this, I got to find a real fucking job and ended up having a great year with support of Luke and, and my teammates. And, 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 you know, it was, it was a great year. And I went through three full years of playing the American league without a single call up until I made the team the following year in training camp. And I had to establish myself as a full time player. And, did you guys play in that dump that. of a rink? You guys still did, did that like dungeon? Right? Room yeah, County, no, I, Room I, County I mean, Coliseum. You sh- I, just, I would shoot from like the red line. It was like oh, was, that was like, that was kind of the advantage. Like <laughs> there was a point where, like this is actually funny to think, but like we'd be like, yes, Vasilevsky's in net. We can score on this guy. You know, it was such a small rink. Like I think he was coming over from Europe, and he was like. What 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 is this rank? Like you'd shoot one from the point and it's like being at the top of the circles in any other rank. And I'm just cranking one timers. And I'm like, you know, we literally were sitting in the locker room, we're like, we got a chance tonight. We're playing against Vasilevsky. And now it's like, don't even bother shooting. Yeah, yeah. 
So, awesome. you know, you brought him up, Luke. Okay. So Luke Richards and your coaching, you know, I certainly, we know how he played. He was as a player. Now you're a mobile puck moving offensive defenseman. How was he able to help you? You know, certainly playing the way he played the game. He didn't play like you. How was he able to help you as a D-man and, and, and turn you into that real pro? You know, I think just preparation, you know, how, how, are, you, how are you preparing uh, for practice every day? How are you preparing for games? Um, you know, he, you know, made it evident that it was like, you know, it's going to be upon, you have to take it upon yourself to, to figure out what's going to get you ready for each game. What's going to get you ready for, um, you know, taking your game to a, to a higher level. And, you know, for a guy like me, we worked on, you know, angling guys, not trying to arm wrestle guys, not trying to get into, to, uh, you know, a, a strength competition in the corner. It's like, how can I angle somebody? How can I take away time and space, you know, using your feet, using your stick. And, um, those were all things that I was, was able to learn from him and, and I've tried to implement in my game and, um, you know, you're never going to be good enough at it. And it's still something I'm working on, but, um, you know, he was huge for that. So you end up getting called up after those three years and bingo, who was the head coach when you got called up in auto? First one, uh, the head coach was Dave Cameron. Okay. Dave Cameron. And then. Um, how long were you with Cameron? Uh, we had him for the first year and then, uh, we had Guy Boucher as the head coach. He came in. Yeah. And that was, that was a big change for our group. It was more structure. It was more, um, you know, regimented, not only on the ice, but just, you know, our daily lives, lots of meetings, lots of details. And, you know, we made it to the conference finals doing that and went on a great run. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's something you look back on. Like if we, I think if we get through Pittsburgh that year, we play Nashville in the finals and they have their two top centermen hurt and, you know, you maybe know. you have a chance to win the cup. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, uh, that didn't happen obviously. And now, um, <laughs> we, we're, we're going to, happen. we're going to Arizona. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're going to Arizona. So, you know, the infamous tape, the infamous Uber ride and, you know, when I look at it and I listen to that, I'm going to sit here and tell you, I don't know how many fucking people have done that. And I think, obviously, the Uber driver is a rat fuck uh, weasel. But, you know, I've been in cabs before. The shit we've said as players about coaching staffs and that. And, and I look the other way, too. The way coaches talk about fucking players, like all of a sudden, you know, like, Players can't talk about coaches. And anyway, we know what was said. Do you think when it come out, how shocked were you that it come out, one? And two, um, did you have that, like, were you sick to your stomach feeling, you know, when it came out? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I can, that's one of those moments in your life you can, you, you basically remember every detail about, you know, all, everything that played out over that week or, or 10 days when, when everything was kind of coming out and, and, um, you know, I had my mother-in-law in town and, and, you know, we found out before the game and then after the game, seeing them and just kind of letting them know like, Hey, this is, this is going to come out and, it, and it's going to change our lives. Uh, I'm not sure how and, and how much, but, um, it's going to, and, you know, just kind of the fallout from all of that. And, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know if I can get into too many details, but, um, you know, it was just a, it was a really, really tough time, um, in my life. And, and, you know, I, I not taking away from, uh, you know, what was said because, you know, we, we were, um, you know, we felt bad about what had happened and, and, and we felt bad for, uh, the coach that was, that was talked about and, and just kind of everything that happened, it, it just seemed like, um, you know, no matter what we said, it, it wasn't going to be enough to, to, uh, express our, you know, sincere apologies. And, and that was difficult too, because I think each one of us felt, um, sorry and, and it was hard to express that. And it was hard to, 
it was kind of hard to stick together because it almost felt like it was every man for themselves. And, um, you know, I ended up being, uh, being traded and, and kind of moved around a little bit that year. And, and, um, you know, it was probably harder on my wife and, and my family because, um, each team I went to, I had 20 guys that were, you know, as supportive as they could be. And, and, um, you know, I really was, was hard on myself that year. It, it affected my play. Um, you know, I would lay in bed every single night and think, you know, did I just ruin my career? And, you know, it, it took a long time to, uh, to, to come to terms with that. And, and, uh, you know, I think I'm finally, you know, in a place where I, I have that behind me, but it's something that I learned a lot from. Uh, I, 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 you know, went to the minors, I, I went to Russia, I did all these things that, um, you know, I had to build myself up as a, as a player and as a person. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the, you know, the father and the husband and the player that I am today because of everything I went through. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, internally within the game though, like I got a lot of guys had to like understand, you know what I mean? Like, like Chris said to begin with, like, I mean, this is no, I think that's so normal. I like, I, I was, and again, yeah, ahead, this is not ahead. a, this is not a poor me. Like I don't, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. And, and, and I again, for, for every, <laughs> yeah, you know, like for every, um, you know, for every negative comment that, uh, was directed towards me or one of the other guys, I think that there was probably three or four, um, positive comments like, Hey man, like, you know, shit happens. Uh, you know, I got your back, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was tough and came, you know, when it came to July one, there wasn't really many options, you know, and whether that was because of my play or because of what had happened, I don't know. I can tell you that my play for sure suffered because of what happened. You know, I, instead of focusing on hockey, I'm thinking about something that happened in an Uber ride in <laughs> November in, in Arizona. So it, it, it really, and again, I'm not looking for sympathy, but the honest to God truth, it, it fucked me up mentally where I, I could no Russia. longer focus so on being the hockey player that I that I was that got me to the NHL. And it fucked me up. And I have never spoken publicly about this and I never wanted to, but that's the, the honest to God truth. I appreciate your honesty. Uh, an honest, you know, and, and it's not easy to talk about. And we've all done things. I've done shit that afterwards, it, it shook me to the core, right? And you know, do you want that second chance? Do you deserve that second chance? When I look at it, you know, like you're the fucking easy guy to send out the door. And that's what it was. It's like some of those other guys, you know, they continued playing. They're still there, but you're the fucking guy who paid the price. And you're not, not the only one who spoke. That being said, um, you know, our lives end up going um I believe, you know, things turn out the way they're supposed to turn out and things do happen for reasons. This happened and I believe people deserve second chances and you certainly have those redeeming qualities. In just a short time I've known you, the short time I've watched you play and I'm so happy you were able to to rebound from this and get another chance, not just in hockey, in the fucking NHL, not just in Russia, not just some, but in the NHL. So I'm happy that you got that second chance and you got that opportunity again, but you go the Edmonton Panthers boom. Uh, you know, you played five games in the, with the Oilers six. So that does have to play on the mind. You end up going to minus San Diego goals. And then you make the decision to go over to Russia. Now, like, do you think, when you were down the my, minus there, a couple different teams, did you think that fucking NHL door was closed? Fuck you, you done, kid. See you later. For sure. No, I mean, there was times I'm, you know, I so I get traded to Edmonton um, and then we get traded to uh, Florida and, and, you know, we're kind of on the merry-go-round and, and uh, you know, we get to Florida and, and the situation seems great. You know, my wife's there. Um, you know, we're looking for a place to rent. We're on, we're on our way to meet the realtor. It's my birthday. GM calls. Hey, we're going to send you to the miners. And I'm like looking at her like, I'm like, oh man, like this year is just, it's getting worse and worse. 
So I tell her, I just say like, why don't you go back to our house in St. Louis? We'll, we'll ship everything there. I'm going to go to the miners by myself. I'm going to stay in a hotel. I'm just going to try to figure this out. Like, I don't want to weigh this down. Like I, I can't put any more of this on you. So we went by myself and I stayed in a Sheraton hotel in, in Springfield, Massachusetts for like 60 days. And I will say that, uh, I know Tim, you spent some time in Russia or quite a bit of time in Russia. Springfield. Those, those 60 days in that Sheraton were harder than any days that I was in Russia. And, and whether I did that to myself or not, I mean, I, I can't argue that because I was extremely hard on myself and I was in a mental place where, you know, I, I look back at some of the conversations that I was having with my parents and, and my wife and, and, you know, my mom would call my wife or my wife would call my mom and, and they were genuinely worried about me. They were like, should we fly out there? Should somebody go see him? And I just begged him. I just said, like, let me figure this out. And um, it was really hard. But yeah, I, I, I truly believed that the NHL door was closed. Um, I got traded at the deadline to, to Pittsburgh and, you know, it just, it, it was not, it was not going well. And that summer, um, nobody was calling. I ended up luckily being able to get a two-way deal and, and in Anaheim and, and they sent me to San Diego. And, you know, at that point I just was like, well, if you're going to play out the last year of your career, might as well do it in San Diego. Right. Like it was, it was one of those things where, um, I'm living in La Jolla, California, one of the most beautiful places in the country. And I am not happy at all. You know, what you see on the, on the surface, you may see me smile, but at home I'm going home and I'm, and I'm tearing myself apart and I still love the game, but I was so upset at where my career was. And it was really hard to, um, go to the rink every day and, and, and play at my highest level. I would have been like hunting this Uber driver down to be honest, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 we had, I had more like, I had more attorneys calling to be like, Hey, you should look at uh, doing something. Then I had teams calling. And, and that was like the thing I said from day one, it was like, I don't want to like litigate or do anything. I just want to play hockey and I want a fair chance at, you know, getting my career back. Yeah. But and, then you go, you go back to like you, when you were laying there watching the Ryder cup and you kind of had, you know, told yourself like, I got to do this. Like now you go to Russia and you're like, that was, that, year, was right? that was Russia again. That was Russia again. I'm, yeah. I'm like, so it, you know, COVID happens. Right. And my agent's like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with the American league or the NHL. Like, you know, I, I could sit there and say like a team's going to call and then we get there and they don't. He's like, I have a deal for you in Russia and the league is backed by the government. So whether there's fans there or they're generating revenue, it doesn't matter. Like you're getting paid and well, you, you hope that there, there's money yeah. there to get paid. Whether you get that money or not is basically up to the team, but um, th the money was there. And so I'm thinking and talking to my wife, you know, I'm like, I think I got to do this if I ever want a chance at playing in the NHL again. And just financially, like the, the you know, we, we had bought a nice house and, and, done a lot of things basically assuming that I'd be able to continue my NHL career. And that was, you know, the year before I was kind of bouncing around in the NHL and then sent to the minors. So we had, we had done all this stuff, like assuming that I'd be able to earn at the level that I was expecting to for a few years. Well, now I'm in a situation where I'm like, well, I kind of needed the money. Let's go do this. And thankfully she was on board. Like we'd been married for 13 days and I'm like, all right, See you later. I'm going to Russia. And the team's like, yeah, we'll get her a visa. Don't worry. Well, the visa came five months later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first still five get, months of our marriage, yeah. <laughs> first five months yeah. of our marriage, I'm over in Russia and she's sitting at home alone with our dog. You know, it's just, it was kind of, a, you know, all of that stuff really makes us appreciate going to the Bell Center, playing, you know, her being able to <laughs> go to the wives lounge, have a glass of wine instead of freezing her ass up in some shitty bench in Russia and trying to, you know, and, 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 and I will say that I, I can't speak to your Russian experience, but the one that I had, I'm so thankful for, uh, the guys were great. The city was better than I could have ever imagined. Yes. There were some really, really shitty nights. Yes. There were some really shitty 
you know, experiences and, and travel situations. But, you know, overall, it's like, what a life experience, not just hockey. Like you really, really are experiencing the world that a lot of people in our, in, in the United States don't get to experience. Like it is, it's a, it's, it's pretty messed up over no, there. No, I times. couldn't agree more with that statement there. I, I, most people, you know, when they ask about my career, they go right to Russia. Right. And then, <laughs> and I do appreciate being there. I think like when I talk about my experience, it's like just how I think, but overall it's, it's, it is an incredible place. You were actually in a pretty good spot there though, Torpedo, right? Like that's Yeah, no, good. the city was I mean, better than I could have ever expected. Uh all three of our coaches played in the NHL, so they all spoke English. Um they ran the Who team. Were your coaches? Uh David Nemirovsky, Sandus Ozlinch, and Artem Chabarov. So I mean Sandus Ozlinch is a like yeah. you know, he was an all-star in the NHL and he's our D coach. And the, you know, you'll appreciate this, Tim. So the, the first practice I get over there and I'm like, well, sh- we're kind of, we, we have some pretty good players. Like we're pretty good. And Sandus is like, we're going to finish an eighth. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean we're going to finish an eighth? He's like, we're going to finish an eighth. Just let it play out. I'm like, okay. So I think we were in like fifth or sixth with like, I don't know, a handful of games remaining. We finished an eighth. I'm not even sure if we got a power. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if we got a power play down the stretch. Like it was like one of those, you know, we finished an eighth and we get swept in the first round and, and whatever. So it, it was, you know, experiencing that kind of was like, okay, well, you know, maybe things are a little different over here. And they're like, stop yelling at the refs. First of all, they don't like you. Second of all, they don't understand you. And third of mm-hmm. all, they've already made their decision before the puck was dropped. So yeah, just, they already got paid. Just, just play. <laughs> yeah. So that was, you know, that was eye opener. But, you know, I, I again, at, for a life experience, very thankful I was able to do it. Um, am I dying to go back? Probably not. Um, did my wife enjoy the two months that she was there? Yes. Was the first night that she was there one of the worst of her entire life? For sure. Um, it just, but that those are great experiences. And, And I will say that leaving Russia, you know, that was probably the strongest that our relationship ever was, right? Like we just, we had each other and that was it. And, and that was cool. And, and I think we can kind of both look back on that experience and and have some appreciation for it. Yeah. Listen, Chris, um, so admirable um, what you did when you were there, because listen, it's, you, you were paying your penance to, some extent you were hard on yourself and you get over there and i've been to russia a few times and the culture shock was incredible now to deal with all that five months on your own and then you get d man of the year you come through big time um to to it says a lot about you as a person and yes as a player so good on you for not folding you know stiffen up the backbone get the chin up and get going. And that's what you did now. So you finish that year and you come back. How does this whole Montreal thing happen? Well, um, to be honest with you, um, it was a personal relationship with Scott Mellenby, who was the assistant GM at the time. Um, We had played golf a handful of times in previous summers. Um, Someone that, you know, I grew up watching play for the Blues, uh, someone I have a lot of respect for, and basically somebody that was willing to give me a second chance. And and I can't thank him enough for uh, taking an interest in me as a person and as a player. And frankly, he probably, you know, was changed my life. You know, I'm not really sure what I would be doing today if it wasn't for him saying like, you know, we're going to give this guy an opportunity to come try to make our team and, and see what he has. And, uh, I mean, I just, I can't thank him enough. I can't thank the organization enough for, for just giving me a chance. And, and I was really fortunate that, um, to get a second chance, but that, that it worked out. And, and for every guy like me, there's hundreds and hundreds of guys that, you know, aren't able to get a second chance and and don't get that opportunity. So that's something that I, you know, kept in the back of my mind throughout last year, even when times were tough, it was, it was like, Hey man, like you've experienced worse and things could be a lot worse. So, um, 
I tried to bring that type of mentality to the rink every day. I tried to keep the guys encouraged and, and to, you know, let guys know that like, Hey man, if we stick together and if we, you know, try to keep a positive outlook, shit's going to get better. And, and if it doesn't happen this year, well, the guys that are back next year, you'll have a leg up on, on training camp because you have that mindset. So, um, I think those experiences helped me kind of get through last year for sure. And looking at the Habs and the situation they're in, okay, they end up getting that first pick. We talked a little bit at the draft. How excited are you as a now? You're like an elder statesman on the I think team. I'm the oldest 30, guy on the team now. Right? 32. <laughs> you went from but 32 years old. And there's an opportunity here for you with a lot of young guys coming in to be able to have an impact on those guys. How how cool is that? And and coming to the Bell Center every day, playing in that building, uh, just the excitement, the energy that comes with playing in Montreal, especially going from Russia, and then all of a sudden you're in the Mecca, really the Mecca of hockey. Yeah, Pretty I mean, cool. I, I basically went from, like you said, like, I mean, no disrespect to Torpedo's rink. I think it was built in like the 50s. It's like it's a nightclub. Yeah, it's like an old Soviet, like, ice arena it's like a tin shit house and now i'm playing in the bell center and it's like you know a complete 180 but you know it's playing in the tin shit house makes me fully appreciate the bell center and every you know it's like wake up and kiss the ground man like this is this is as good as it gets and then you know just the the, the direction that the team is going the young guys that we have coming in it is so much fun to be a part of because these guys are full of energy. They want to get better. They work hard. Um, having Marty as our coach, he's kind of like, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a more perfect fit for kind of the way that he wants to develop guys as players in a team concept, but also as individuals. And it's fun to come to the rink every day. And it's hard for, it's hard for a non-playoff team to say that, right? And it's no disrespect. Obviously, we want to win games. We want to be competitive. But I think that the stuff we went through last year will give us a leg up going into this year. I think we're going to be a lot more competitive than people think. And it has to do with, you know, just kind of having that mindset that we're going to get better every day and we'll take some lumps, but we'll come back the next day and 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 swing and, and get back in the fight. Marty. Okay, we have Marty on here, and uh, he hadn't signed his new deal yet with the Habs. And we had him on. We t Listen, when he got named, I think a lot of people in the city, obviously, were shocked. Marty St. Louis, he hasn't coached anyway. He was coaching kid. Fine. And I spoke with you and Nick, um, and you said, when you heard him speak the first time he talked to the team, You've never heard anything like that before come out no. of a coach's mouth. And and can you kind of just convey the gist of what he said? And, and you know, yeah, I mean, because it was so I, positive, right? For I'm you? not, I'm not going to like, I don't want to divulge too much. I'm like, I'm sure you guys are like what's said in the room stays in the room, but he, to have the impact that he did on our group so quickly and to hear guys that, you know, we have guys that have worked in the organization for 30 plus years and they're leaving that meeting and they're saying to us players, that was the best speech that they've heard in hockey. And there's been some very, very famous coaches that have coached in Montreal, very famous, you know, front office executives and, and players. And that's pretty special. And you kind of saw the message that he delivered to start the draft and, and, and different things. And this is not somebody that's doing this for, money or attention like he's a hall of famer he made a shitload of money playing hockey this is his, this is him being genuine like he likes he loves hockey he loves to help people and he wants to make guys better and i'm not sure and it's no knock to any coach that i've ever had or any other coach in the league but it's it's pretty unique to have a to have a coach that um you know believes that if he can make you a better individual player that it will benefit the team. And he takes time out of, I mean, I'm not sure if this guy sleeps. He is on 24, like, like we will like have a long flight. You'll see him in the breakfast room and he's like spry. And I'm like, Jesus, man, this guy is a machine, you know? 
And so it's, it, it, it kind of, it motivates you. It's like, all right, well, if our coach is doing it and he's, you know, 15 years older than me, and then I got to get my ass going here. Like, let's go. And I think it's great for the young guys, right? They see him, he's in the gym in the mornings. He's got a sweat on while we're having breakfast. And it's like, all right, if he's doing it, we, you know, we all got to get our ass in gear. So, um, I think it's great for us and I'm, I'm excited just to get this year going. I loved him when we had him on too, but you're right. It's kind of like, he's almost like he's doing it. He's like giving back to the game, right? Like he's, it's awesome. Cause his story was crazy too. And like all the things he got through to, to get to where he's at and being a hall of famer, but I can only imagine, um, you know, what it's like to have him as a coach. And that's, that's great. You guys have him for sure. Yeah. Never drafted. And, um, um, you know, we talked, we spoke at the, uh, the draft obviously. And, um, <laughs> And I know this is not your place to pick players. I get it. It's a general manager. And here you are, a member of this team. And the knock on the team over the years is they were small. A lot of small players. Got some size on back on D at one point when they went to the final. They had all big defense and a lot of small forwards. I believe that perfect mix is you need size, speed, up the middle, on the wings, you can't have all big, but you got to have that blend. How shocked were you when, I mean, everybody in Montreal is thinking, right, I looked out in the crowd, everybody got right jerseys on, right jerseys, right? And all of a sudden, they step up to the microphone and they pick this kid, and he is a freaking monster, this kid. He almost broke the bike when he was doing the, the, the test the next day, but how how shocked were you and excited were you that they picked this kid, Seth Lawson? Yeah, I mean, de- definitely excited. I mean, at any time the, the team has the, the first overall pick and it was in our home arena and I had the opportunity to come to the draft, I, I wasn't going to miss that. That was a really, really cool moment to, to be a part of, um, just kind of being around the, the buzz and everything. But, you know, when they made the selection, um, you know, you, you heard the crowd, everybody reacted, whatever, but – um, you just look at our, our management staff. I mean, these guys are thorough. They're not doing this to, they're not doing this for fun. They understand that this is the Montreal Canadians and these guys want to get the Montreal Canadians back to where they should be. And that's at the top of the league. So, um, they, they are, I don't think they're going to really be influenced by media or, or what anybody else thinks. These guys are thorough they do their due diligence and they're going to build a team that I don't know, you know, how long it's going to take, but the Montreal Canadiens will be a uh, premier team in the NHL very soon. Yeah. You know, I tend to agree with you. Honestly, I, I, I look what Jeff Gordon has done in the past in Boston, in New York and him uh, coupled with uh, uh, Hughes, I, I just think the two of them got it going. going and I already have a contract, no, so I don't need to. No. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not trying to. I'm not sucking up to I anybody. Know. But but like working with these guys, it's like, you know, it's like they they treat you with so much respect. They treat you with so much. They're trying to create an environment where guys can thrive. Guys feel comfortable. Guys can be themselves uh, within the team and and play to the best of their abilities where, you know, you have some managers that want to put the fear of God in, in players and it just, you know, guys are just, they don't feel right, you know? So this is, yeah. this is kind of a, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of something new where, you know, if you're checked in, if you take care of yourself, um, you know, physically and, and you're in shape and, and basically you give a shit and, and you want to work hard and be a part of this team there's no issues, you know, they, they want to have guys that are, you know, self-motivated and, you know, want to get better. And it's fun. It's, they're fun to be around. They're good guys. A lot. I mean, these guys ask about my kid more than my own friends do, you know, they're like, Hey, how's Henry doing? They know, they know his name. It's like, it's just, it's just good, good people, you know? So, um, I already have my contract, so I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to, <laughs> to, to suck up or anything, but Honest to God, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a great uh, a great staff, and I, I think that the people and the fans of Montreal should be very excited. How old's your son? Seven months. 
Okay. I was going to say, you have, I didn't know if you had them in Russia or whatnot. But. We did not have them in Russia. That was, <laughs> that was also part of the reason why it was, it was very necessary to come back to, uh, to North America. All How, right. Um, here's the fucking worst. Just, oh, yeah. Just right. quickly, uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you, how about your wife coming to Montreal? That city, what a great city is, restaurants, all that. And, and, de- and obviously having to deal with the Russian thing when you were over there, that's one thing. So, yeah, they speak French in Montreal, but it can't be that big a adjustment, really, after having been in Russia. But uh, how excited are you about, like, living and being in that city and actually experiencing what Montreal, Montreal is all about? Yeah, I mean, it, she loved the city. I think the you know, the culture, the, like you said, the restaurants, it's, it's, I think as good as you're going to find in North America. And I think, um, you know, for us, we hadn't spent a lot of, t- we had not spent a lot of time there. Uh, so it was a lot of fun this past year exploring. I mean, yes, there were restrictions that kind of hindered that, but, um, you know, we're excited to get back and, and to hopefully things will be open and, and, and fully open and we'll be able to have that, that true Montreal experience. But, you know, she loved the city and, and I think the hardest thing out of anything is right now is finding a place to live. We're looking for anybody out there listening. We're looking for a rental, uh, uh, at least two bedrooms and, and something that, uh, you know, we can get into. Chris uh, has room. Some- you have an extra room, right, Chris? September yeah, oh, yeah. 1st. Of them. Yeah, we'll, we'll bunk up. You can, you can rock my seven month old to sleep every night. If that's, <laughs> yeah. that sounds good, right? <laughs> The babysitter. Um, listen, uh, Chris, awesome stuff. And I, I just want to say, I want to thank you for coming on, but listen, uh, looking at what you've been through and how you persevered through that, going over to Russia, coming back. I, I, I'm going to tell you just sitting here in the short time I've known you, I'm so happy that you did get that second chance. You have paid your penance and, 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 just don't be so hard on yourself moving forward. I'm so happy you're able to put it behind you and, and you got your life back and you have your career back in the NHL. I think it's so awesome. So good on you. Says a lot about you. I uh, agree. You I much. agree. It's an incredible story, Chris. I think I appreciate you, you opening up a little bit too about some things. I think it's awesome. You know, if it's like you take everything today and it's like everything that happened to you happened for you. Right. Um, for sure. And I, th- you know, I think it's awesome where you're at and you deserve it. You should be proud, man. It's awesome. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Good guys. Stuff. And thank you for having uh, me. I, I appreciate it. Listen, Chris, quick. We have producer Barry. He's always a pain in the ass. He has to ask a couple questions. I, I was wondering how involved were your parents in your in hockey and everything. It sounded like they were kind of didn't play hockey and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, my mom grew up as a, a little bit of a speed skater on an outdoor rink in St. Louis. Uh, my dad to this day cannot ice skate. I'm not even sure if he can rollerblade. Uh, mm-hmm. I grew up learning hockey through watching blues games with my parents. They were my my grandfather was an original season ticket holder for the blues. Um, my mom, it was my mom's father. Uh, she had five sisters and they would rotate who would get to go to the games uh, with my grandpa. And my mom loves hockey. And, and when she met my dad, they enjoyed hockey. They ended up having season tickets and, and they, they like hockey. And, and I literally learned the game from watching it on TV. My dad would drop me off at the rink and say, basically listen to the coach. Cause I have no fucking clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, my last question, I ask a lot of people this question and it's early for you, but if you, they were writing your hockey eulogy, what would the first sentence say? Your hockey eulogy. How is this guy? How did he? How, how is this guy still playing? I think I told someone <laughs> the other day. Like I feel like, um, you know, I'm not blessed with the size. I'm not blessed with speed. I'm not blessed with, you know, my dad didn't play. He's not a Hall of Famer. He didn't play a thousand games in the NHL. I truly believe that I'm one of like ten average Joes in the NHL, and I couldn't be more thankful. I, I've worked extremely hard. I've been through a lot, but I'm just an average dude, man. I, I could be sitting behind a desk, working a job or, or, or doing something else very easily. I, I'm so lucky to have had a second chance uh, at my career. I'm so lucky that I even got a first chance. And I know for 
every player that makes it to the NHL, there's handfuls of players that are good enough to make it that never get the opportunity. So um, sitting here where I am today, I, I can, I can appreciate that. And, and I'm very thankful, but yeah, I think my, the, the eulogy would start with like, how the hell did this guy do this? Geez, that was awesome with Chris Weidman. Listen, I'm so happy for the kid and talk about perseverance and, you know, he, he was hard on himself. Uh, he certainly, he had a tough time dealing with what happened. He's the one who got fucking run out of town. Those other guys still in the NHL, they were still playing. Uh, you know, Shabbat's the number one D-man. They all had fucking something to say. So they hanged the easy, he was the easy guy to fucking hang. Run them out of town. Um, man, he's thinking his career's over. And then, you know, he, he sticks with it, sticks with it. And that's tough stuff to deal with. You're sitting, sitting with that shit yourself. His wife is back in St. Louis and then over in Russia. And, and you got to give him props for, you know, fucking backbone. That kid has backbone. And God bless him. He has redeeming qualities. And he's a good person. And I'm so happy. I love when I see guys get another chance. I got a fucking second chance myself. And I know what that's like. So to see this kid get it, I couldn't be happier for him. He deserves it. 